All right, Gregory, if you can start us off. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, happy midterms week for all our Baruch students. And, you know, we're getting around to Halloween. So welcome to our project management pan panel workshop uh, with Paul Weiss and everyone else here. Um, and so let's get started. So first, we just want to promote a little bit for our upcoming event for Python. Uh, it's a Python workshop on the 28th from you know the same time slot. And for this event, we will be doing an intro to data structures and algorithms. Um, and you know, it's just a good introduction for anyone who's looking to you know dip themselves uh, into Python a little bit. And then right here, we're going to have our QR codes uh, for our Discord community. Um, it's a great way to get involved with all the other AIS members. And then on top of that, we're going to have our link tree code to the right. Uh, and that's just going to be a resources for a bunch of different things uh, that you can get in contact with us. All right. And that's my turn to speak. But first, I'll also introduce the leadership team as well um, before we introduce our lovely panelists um, for taking the time to join us today. Uh, my name is Helen. I'm currently the president of AIS for the semester. Um, we've been hosting a bunch of events throughout, and we have many coming in November, so please look out for that. Um, yeah, I'm a senior. I'm also in computer information systems like most of you guys, and we hope you guys enjoy the event. I'm going to pass it off to Gregory and Kai to do the same thing. So yeah, sorry, didn't introduce myself or the others. Uh, my name is Gregory, uh, recent transfer, third year student, uh, information systems major with a specialization in data analytics. I'm Kai, I'm the secretary of AIS. I'm also a senior, I'm in CIS general track. Nice to meet you all. Thanks. So Mary, um, I'm gonna pull it off to your slides. Um, and while we still are admitting people in, you guys can all talk a little bit more about yourself um, and what you guys do at Paul Weiss, your background, and how did you all get into management. But I'll leave it on the cover of your slides, okay? Awesome. Thank you, Helen. Um, my name is Mary Wynn. Um, I'm the ISPMO manager. I have a psychology degree. Um, so I got started in project management, honestly, by chance, it fell into my lap. Um, I originally thought I was going to be in healthcare, but here I am here many years later. Um, so that's a little bit about my background. Outside of work, I love to cook. So I'll hand it off to uh, Mark, my colleague. Thanks, Mary. Um, my name is Mark Lagaris. I'm a program manager at Paul Weiss. Um, I've been with Paul Weiss for eight years. Um, my background before, uh, so... Um, I graduated with a finance degree, um, went into banking um, at one of the worst times during the Great Recession. So my first two years of work were really fun in terms of bouncing around at places uh, within city. Um, how I came into project management was uh, city actually sold off their brokerage business called Smith Barney. And I was in charge of moving all of their alternative investment assets all out of the bank. And so it was kind of a side project that I started working on, got really into it and liked doing that more than my you know, main job, um, and then transitioned into project management roles after that. Um, what are your hobbies outside of work? That one's fun because the other question might be a little bit, we'll get into them later. Um, I'm a big uh, uh, runner. Um, I've run the New York City Marathon, uh, I've run the Chicago Marathon, and I'm going to run the Berlin Marathon next. Um, and then I'll turn it over to uh, Irene. Hey everyone, um, my name is Irene Plains. I've been at Paul Weiss for about two and a half years. Um, and I'm one of the IS uh, project managers. Um, I started my career in, in information technology in the uh, sort of network um, systems application, uh, server management, data management, uh, data analysis. So I have a, a pretty heavy um, technical background, um, but uh, as, I, as my career progressed, I started to move into more strategic um, leadership roles. And in those roles, I found myself um, managing projects. And so that piqued my interest in, in that, um, you know, and for that reason, I pursued project management, um, uh, applied for the PMP, 
and obtain my certification. Um, thereafter, I joined the Paul Weiss team um, because they were an established PMO. Um, they had a large team. They were definitely much larger than my previous firm um, as far as the PMO goes and, um, and even legal. Um, so yeah, I'm looking forward to answering some of your questions. Uh, thanks for having me. Um, passing it over to Val. Hi everyone, thank you for joining. My name is Val Darmalingam. Uh, I'm, I joined um, Paul Weiss earlier this year in April. Uh, my background is also in finance like Mark, uh, but prior to joining Paul Weiss, I worked for an insurance company. Uh, I was exposed to operational development, business development, where more of my roles were focused on project management. Uh, and then I continued my educational studies in PM courses, where I also um, learned the discipline, the methodology, and the tools, and uh, also led me to taking my PMP certification and, um, and growing uh, my educational background and then leveraging my experience um, in the field and uh, has led me here to Paul Weiss. And I'll lead, um, hand this over to Derek. Thanks, Val. Uh, Derek Cortez. Um, I've been at Paul Weiss uh, relatively early, uh, like Val, earlier this year. Um, I started out uh, in college as a communications major, so similar to Mary, um, kind of fumbled my way into project management, um, Paul Weiss I minor as well. Um, I think I got into PMing. Uh, kind of by chance when I was at school, um, I worked for my university's help desk, taking support calls for many of those who are on the line right now, actually, I assume. Um, and then that kind of gave me a, a good technology background in terms of just how to think technology. Um, and I started out as an associate PM at a, at a tech consulting firm and hopped around over the years um, from tech consulting to investments and finance. Um, and now I'm at Paul Weiss uh, doing legal project management with the team. Um, fun stuff, uh, like Mark, I like to run, fitness. Um, I'm big into photography, film photography. If anyone knows, then you know. Um, and I think that's it for now for me. Um, and I'll pass it over to Sandra. Hi, hello everyone. <clears throat> I'm Sandra Belusian, I'm a program manager. I've been at Paul Weiss for two years. Uh, my background is in business. I studied economics and I had an MBA. And um, I got into um, technology program management because of my love of technology and relating technology to the business processes. Um, a lot of the projects that I work on have, uh, you know, um, I work with a lot of the business stakeholders like the marketing and knowledge management teams. Um, my hobbies, I love to do yoga, I play tennis and I ski. Wow, thank you all for the introductions. Um, for those who don't know what Paul Weiss is, it is a law firm of over more than a thousand lawyers, if I remember correctly, which is pretty big. Um, when I was there for a sprint internship, we, there were so many backgrounds, so many personalities, ideas and interest in that law firm, and it was very innovative. Um, and I also got to meet the associates, so that was great. Uh, I will pass it off to Gregory to start the questions um, for our panelists. Awesome. Thank you. Um, so I guess the first question, I'm going to give this one to Mark and Sandra. Uh, and this question will be, uh, what are the most you know, quintessential soft and hard skills for this type of role? And then are there any certifications to kind of hone in on those sort of hard skills? Um, so I'll take, I'll take the first part of the question regarding you know, soft skills and hard skills. Um, I think, you know, there, there are definitely are hard skills that, you know, can um, help project managers um, first, you know, attain the role of project manager and then, you know, succeed within it. Um, you know, things like accuracy, attention to detail, um, and then using, you know, several of the project management um, tools, all that goes a long way. But I think it, um, what's more important really is, you know, the focusing of soft skills, right? So you join a team, um, most of these people you work with but don't report into you. Um, how do you, you know, create that, that team that moves together to get something done? You know, it involves, um, you know, negotiation skills. Uh, it involves, you know, uh, promoting maybe certain voices within the team that, you know, are not as apt to talk about, you know, an issue or something that's coming up. 
So I think um, you know, soft skills and development of soft skills goes a long way um, in this particular role. Um, Sandra, do you wanna take the second piece? Sure, in terms of the certifications, um, there is a certification, the PMP certification. Uh, it's nice to have, but it's absolutely not required. So, um, so um, you can look into that, but uh, it's usually after graduation, I believe, but um, I don't have it. So any, uh, it's just the interest and soft skills uh, um, are key components for this role, as Mark mentioned. Awesome, thank you both. I really appreciate that. And then this question will be for Val and Irene. Uh, what aspects of the job do you find the most appealing and also the least appealing? Okay, great. I'll take the most appealing. Uh, um, being a project manager, the most appealing is you're on the forefront. You get to see applications and business processes before anyone else in the firm or your company will be able to see it. And so you're a part of the change that's going into the firm. You're, you're collaborating with different business teams. You're collaborating with different IS management teams. And, you know, you're making an impact on the workflow of the firm and seeing how that change translate over the different stages. It's quite rewarding. So th that would be some of the aspects. That would be some of the things I enjoy about the project managing. As far as, um, as far as, you know, not as appealing, I would say, I would reframe it as challenging, is really just managing the different personalities that you have to work with. Um, that's pretty self-explanatory. Um, as far as managing expectations, that's another one that I think, you know, can be very challenging at times. Um, you know, everyone has, you know, everyone's uh, need is is just as important as the next person's and sort of managing that is is can be a little bit of a of a challenge when you want to please you know and you want to make sure that people are happy with what you're delivering um getting buy-in is another challenge um and being able, having to convince um people that you know change is good um so sometimes that might not be uh as appealing but I do look at it as an opportunity to, to strengthen that sort of pivoting muscle, right? That you constantly have to pivot. So um, that's what I would find as maybe least appealing, but really more than anything challenging at times. Thank you both. Um, and then I'm gonna move this last, uh, one more question to Sandra and Val. Um, and then for, you know, many students at a business school, the closest thing they can get for project management will be group projects. Uh, what can students do during these group projects to help them start thinking in the same mindset that project managers do? Right, the first bit uh, when you start working on a project is um, who the group is and, um, and who's gonna be responsible for what, uh, identifying, um, um, the team members and uh, what responsibilities they have is the first bit. Uh, this way, you know, um, the project will run more smoothly and everybody's clear of what they need to do. Uh, the next thing is very clear is what's the objective, what's the goal of the, of the project you're managing. Uh, it, it, you know, it should be defined, it should be very art articulated um, so that uh, you stay within the scope of what you're trying to accomplish. And Val can say a lot more about this topic. Yeah, I mean, be, being a student and having to juggle many classes, uh, your group members are already managing different schedules of, of different uh, individuals in their groups. So you guys are already starting to implement project management um, uh, tools, right? So once you know you get the logistics and understand the scope of the project you want to you know determine the metrics you and your team are going to use to uh track deliverables decide on completion of tasks and record milestones because those are important um, um events to track and record and share as your project is progressing um and also just being adaptable being ad being um, adaptable to changes that may come along the way in your projects or if any risk or unexpected issues come along the way, um, be open to pivoting at different times of, of the project. 
Really appreciate that insight. That's something I think we can all use in school every day, being business school students and working in projects. Thank you, Gregory. Um, I'll take the last two questions or the few questions we do have in chat and I'll save them a li um, for a bit later. Um, I know Sandra talked a little bit about the PMP certification. Um, this is what the students want to know about. Um, this is the golden question. So getting a certification, as always, it's a long process. It's something that takes months um, to study and also to pass for. Um, do you recommend students who are aspiring um, to become a project manager to take their certification as they are in school? Or is that something you do um, after landing an internship or an associate position first? And this is a question directed to Irene and Derek. Uh, I can start with this one, yeah, my Irene. Um, so I think the the main like bread and butter certifications for project managers in the industry is is your PMP, but there's also um, what's called the the CAP, the CAP M, um, the Certified Associate. Um, I would start answering this question by saying absolutely do not need certification, like Sandra said too. Um, in fact, some of the best PMs I know don't have certifications. Um, I will say too, though, that I have had both the CAPM certification before I got my PMP. And for the CAPM itself, I found that it was more useful to give a framework for how to be a good PM um, with that methodology. Um, and then for the PMP, it kind of just shows that you're that committed. Uh, I think too, that for the CAPM and the PMP, you need to actually have um, a certain amount of time for work experience. So as far as like, do you jump straight into a PMP, uh, sorry, a PM role versus getting a certification? Um, the, my kind of bottom line answer would be, you kind of need work experience to get the PMP to show that you have done PMing to some degree. Um, the CAPM could be useful if you're interested from an academic standpoint and give you a, a framework. Um, but I, my, my recommendation is start working. It doesn't even have to be an associate role or a PM role. Just getting something that can put you in a position to, to speak with a lot of different folks. Yeah, and piggybacking off of what Derek is saying, um, you know, 100%, um, it's definitely going to give you the tools that um, that will help you sort of when you're approaching a project, have a good framework to start with. And each time you're starting a new project, you have that framework to refer, to refer back to. Um, some resources out there, you know, you can join meetups, you can join the PMI.org, um, become a member, um, maybe join the New York City um, chapter. Um, and, you know, there's always volunteer opportunities there, which you can use towards your PMP if you do choose to pursue it. Again, it's a personal preference, but project management um, is really about that experience, right? Because you, you do have to um, deal with a lot of unknowns and having that framework to fall back on is always very helpful. The only other thing I'll add actually, Irene, is um, because PM is such an open-ended kind of career path um, and, and the fact that even the team that we're on right now is, is so varied in background, um, don't assume that if you get a role as an intern or get a role as a starting position, that it's gonna be the exact same as another place that says you have a PM position. Um, you can kind of learn the skills and it's more unique to the team you work with and how good you are with people. Um, so, you know, more about uh, get your feet wet, see if you like doing this kind of work. Yeah, and remember, you know, this is not just for work, right? You can carry this into life. So it, it definitely doesn't hurt. Yeah, and I want to just follow up with um, a few things. So CUNY Baruch College is very special. Um, we're very business centric. Um, and a lot of our bachelor's degrees, associate's degrees are centered around business. Um, and project management itself is pretty new. It's pretty recent. Um, there's not curriculums that are released out there to many universities or colleges. So students don't really have um, the academic background in project management. So how should a student go about finding such opportunities in project management? Um, I, I, my undergrad and grad studies was finance. So when I, when I was doing my studies, uh, like you said, Ellen, project management was not available. So what I did was I focused my continuous studies, um, looking at different programs in different schools and uh, NYU offered 
a, a continuous education program where they offered project management. So that was the route that I chose to um, learn the methodology. Um, so look at different um, schools, look at different online programs. Uh, LinkedIn has a lot of uh, educational tools regarding project management courses. So that could also be an avenue or a resource available to students. Great, thank you so much, Val. Um, oh, talking about LinkedIn, um, Baruch also released LinkedIn Learning for free for college students just recently in the last month. So if you guys sh should definitely go check it out. Um, and so the next question I have will be our last and final before I do a preview of our Q&A so far. Um, so this is a question directed to Derek and Mark. Um, in your view, or op also open up to the floor, what has been the biggest difference between in project, in project management across different industries such as finance, insurance, and also the legal industry? Derek, do you wanna go first? Yeah, yeah, I'll take it. Um, I think the I think the, the the question is interesting because it's like how are they different across the industries? I would say truthfully, PMing itself is not really different across the industries. It's more like what are the the better you know the industry, the better you'll be at a PM in that industry. I would say, but you don't you absolutely don't need to know. I don't think there's a lot of difference between PMing and industries, right? It's it's how good of a communicator are you. Um, how well can you kind of work soft skills with different individuals? Can you stick to timelines? Um, I mean, clearly there are differences in terms of like what technology, what kind of systems or like finance is not going to be legal versus insurance. But at the end of the day, I think you can kind of say skirt by, but you can be a great PM, not really knowing a lot about the industry, um, though it'll always help. Uh, yeah, and, and I think to piggyback off of that, maybe more the difference between finance and legal. Um, when I worked in project management and finance, you know, um, I'd be part of these huge projects that would be three years um, just to get, you know, one small deliverable across the line, be 100 people. Um, and there might even be different PMO offices, so different groups of project managers assigned to different business lines. You know that the investment in project management is really high, and a lot of you know uh, major financial institutions they don't even see themselves as that. They see themselves as tech companies, so they've kind of adopted PMO and project management and uh, the you know those ideas. In legal, it's definitely definitely different. Um, you know, Paul Weiss is one of the firms that um, really invests in, in the project management discipline and its impact on the technology that it adopts. And so, you know, you see there's a whole team responsible for projects for Paul Weiss. You know, at, at all law firms, um, especially from when I started to now, I don't know if that was, you know, the, the same, you know, you might have a project manager who's really, you know, a developer on the side. And so they have to wear both hats. So I would say, you know, legal now definitely is adopting it where all of the, you know, uh, major law firms have some type of PMO presence, but it's not um, to the same kind of magnitude as, you know, it is in finance. I will say to Mark, actually, the, the finance side of it, you're right. The, um, sometimes it's, I found that in, in previous places that I've been at that were finance focused, um, it is very large sized companies, especially if you're at a larger company. And just because of the size of that, maybe they will have PMs managing a large um, swath of work. Um, I have to really say too, though, you know, a little bias here, but I love Paul Weiss in that, you know, this is the largest PM team I've had. And it's it's such a nice um, switch to be have, uh, to work with people who are like-minded and kind of think the same way as you, um, because it allows more exchange of ideas and management styles. Yeah, thank you guys all for answering that question. Um, I do have a bonus one, and this is coming from me. Um, so it sounds like you guys have were, were or wear many different hats depending on the project that you guys were working on. Is there really any a difference between a technical project manager or just a project manager? And this is um, maybe I I can start. So at Paul Weiss, I don't think there's that much. Uh, of a difference and we don't make that distinction. I think we all vary between our you know, nerdiness in technical ability 
um, you know, business process management. Um, and so we all, you know, will liaise with um, an SME, a subject matter expert that really knows the technology. Um, and then we help bridge that with the people that are looking for the solution, right? So if it's a different department, say it's HR, you know, we can be that liaison between HR asking for something that they need to help them. And, you know, the, the brilliant developer that works at Paul Weiss that can, you know, do something really magical with a couple databases. So I think it varies. Um, and maybe to link up to one of the other differences between, you know, legal and finance is just the, ver the, the varying types of projects that we get to work on because we are a law firm. We're a little, we're definitely smaller than a company like Citibank, you know, that has 300,000 people. Um, that gives us also the diversity to work on different things. And so, you know, I may have, you know, worked um, in the past with our finance department, you know, implementing, you know, a billing solution for the last couple of years. And might be a little bit closer to that, but Sandra has maybe worked with a different department. And so we get to kind of, you know, across uh, those different expertise because we get to work on so many different varying projects. And that's definitely a big difference between, you know, law firm and project management at some of the bigger financial institutions. Thank you, Mark. Uh, there was a few of us in the, in the leadership team who was interested in project management after we started bringing Paul Weiss um, into the picture for our events this um, October, but I'm glad to know. Uh, so now we'll be moving to a different section of our workshop and I'll be passing it off to Paul Weiss um, to present their part of the slides. So um, Mary, if you let me know which slide to move on next, I'll do that for you. Thank you so much, Helen. If we could just start on the first slide, that'd be great, or the next one after this. Um, so now that everyone's sort of gotten a, a quick and dirty overview of what project management is, we thought we'd start with just sort of a formal, simple, but powerful definition of project management. Um, so here, what we're defining as project management is really is about the process of leading a work of a team to achieve the project goals, but you know, within the given constraints. So constraints being time, money, um, and you know, what the scope of the work is. Um, so with that, I'm going to hand it over to Mark. Helen, uh, next slide, please. Okay, uh, so this slide has a lot on it, um, but what it's really meant to convey is that um, no matter what um, you know type of job you do take you know after you graduate you most likely are going to be involved in a project you may not run the project but you will be a stakeholder or have a piece of that project um, and even though um, you know th this slide is meant to convey the different stages of that know that wherever you are they might call it something completely different or kind of have different rules in place uh, for for this but you could almost always distill the, the major steps in any project down to these four. Um, and the first is the initiation stage. This really represents um, putting together all the information um, that's critical for you know, senior um, leaders at the, at the company to make a decision, right? So um, you know, every company has a strategy um, and if a project is you know, requested or if a project is brought up, um, you know, that team has to make sure that this one project fits into that strategy. Um, they also have to make sure that, you know, they're, they're, the benefits outweigh the cost of that project. Um, and at Paul Weiss, we have different committees that are responsible for that. We help by gathering all that information. Um, but really, every organization is going to have some kind of, you know, gatekeeping before you just start the work on that project. Um, the second phase, which is the planning phase, um, and it really is the longest period, um, the longest stage within the, the life cycle, um, is now that you've gotten all of that information, you know what the goals are, you know what your budget constraints are, um, and sometimes you have to work backwards from a target date. So you need something you know, by the end of the year. Um, that planning stage is really, as a project manager, bringing everyone together, um, your subject matter experts, um, the owners of the products, uh, your leaders, the people who ultimately make the decisions on the project, 
you bring them together and, and you agree upon all of the tasks that bring you to that end date. Um, the, the one thing that's really important here is the more time that you spend on this phase, uh, really it makes everything else easier down the road because you talk through um, most of the plan, you understand what risks can come up um, just by you know, uh, bringing those teams together. Um, and we're gonna spend a lot more of our session today on this phase, this planning phase. Um, so once that's done and you agree upon that, you know, that timeline, really you're um, you know, in the execution phase where you're working with the team to set out um, and complete those tasks to get to you know, the completion of the project. Um, the way that we do this is you know, we're in constant contact with the project teams. Um, we have a really great relationship where you know, yes, we have certain tasks set out and it can be quite rigid, but there's, it's also commonplace for people to bring up things that just weren't planned for, uh, risks that pop up, um, or maybe sometimes, un, you know, unaccounted for changes. So, you know, that can be, um, you know, um, th those changes can, you know, um, not happen at all or happen quite frequently. And it's really the ability to kind of, you know, um, change with it, um, provide transparency to the managers who are interested in the project. Um, and lead the teams through that. And then the last piece, um, you know, this, the, I think this is one of the most important pieces is um, the closure stage. So you've worked for say a whole year to deliver something um, to the, uh, the customer or client um, and a year can change a lot of things. It can change the importance, it can change, you know, um, what you learn along the way. And so, Closure for us is making sure that the thing that we delivered, you know, it met the original goal, but it still meets their their goal for today, right? And you do that by, you know, um, analyzing the results of usage, um, you know, checking in with the team members um, on, you know, on their feedback on the product, and then ultimately learning, you know, what could have maybe done, be done better for the next project. Um, and so those are the phases. And again, we're going to spend more time on the planning stage. Um, and if Helen, you can move to the next slide. Val's going to take the next one. Thank you. Um, I love this visual because it says so much, right? Uh, as Mark mentioned earlier, we spend a lot of time in the planning stage, right? So that's what the top portion of this of this visual shows that we would like everything to go according to plan. But then the bottom part of this visual is showing that we're gonna have some highs and lows. We're gonna run into some obstacles, some risks, some unidentified issues, and we're gonna have to move forward, right? And this visual is showing um, how the team is going to move forward with those bumps. Uh, speaking of some bumps, our next slide, Derek is gonna share what we can anticipate while we're going through a project through all those phases. Helen, you could move to the next slide. Thank you. Thanks, Mel. And thanks, no Mel. problem. Um, yeah, so these are just some of the challenges. Um, I'm going to take a couple of these and pass the, the others to Sandra. But um, I mean, these being a sample size, don't assume that only products have these. Um, but the first kind of challenge that you may experience as a PM is unclear goals. Um, Quite literally, if you are trying to accomplish something on a project with a team or with a group of people, and you don't actually know what you're trying to do, or you're not sure um, how you should do it, right? That's clearly uh, starting on the wrong foot in terms of um, how to progress with the project. Um, scope creep, uh, I'll give a little bit of background. So scope is basically what is supposed to be done in a given project. Like what do you agree upon at the start? Which is kind of why, and okay, echoing what Marcus said, why that planning stage is so important, right? You want to understand what um, is the, the the tasks you want to accomplish by the end of it, and scope creep then is subsequently if you set out to do ten different things on a project, and over the course of that project, three or four get added on. There's nothing inherently wrong with that, but you as a PM need to be responsible or responsible enough uh, to be aware of that and and call it out, whether for good or for bad. Um, and then three, unrealistic deadlines, pretty straightforward. If you're trying to get something done and you and your knowledge and working with the different teams you have access to um, kind of say, hey, this is too soon or you know, maybe too long of a time, um, it's also important to kind of call that out as well. All right, so uh, a couple of more um, challenges. Uh, what could be a risk? Uh, right now, uh, within the COVID environment, for example, we don't know who's going to be 
uh, available to do the work. So that's a huge risk that uh, you might not have the uh, staff to do the work. Uh, so risks can be anticipated or they can be unanticipated and you should be able to manage them. Uh, the last one we have on the, on the slide is team challenges. This comes back to a lot of the soft skills we talked about. So uh, we could, you know, team members might have conflicting interests or they might not get along. Uh, and, uh, and you just have to figure out how to um, work these things out, uh, the relationships between the team members to ensure the project moves on as expected. Move on to the next slide to item. Thanks, everyone. Now that we, um, thanks for that introduction, team. Um, now that you have a basic understanding of project management, um, as a next step, uh, we'll separate into a breakout sessions um, to work through a scenario we've prepared for you. Um, before any implementation, a lot of planning takes place, as Mark mentioned at the beginning um, on the second slide. Um, so uh, for this scenario, what we'd like you to do is help the owner of a new restaurant with their grand opening. Um, you'll have three weeks to prepare. And within that breakout session, what we'd like is a volunteer to help us recap some of the findings within that session. So hoping you guys are thrilled for that. <laughs> um, while we're in that session, we'd like you to also think about a few things. Um, who should be involved? Um, what are their tasks? And what do you want to what do you want to do, or what what do you do when you encounter some issues, right? And some of the things to consider, um, as in the previous slide um, that Derek and Sandra went through, were risks and issues, team challenges, and slow creep. And hopefully, you'll get that within this working session. So um, I guess I'll turn it over to Helen uh, for us to get started. Yeah, thank you so much, Irene. Um, so, ooh, whoa, spoiler alert. Um, so I'm going to break us up into breakout sessions, as Irene said. Um, so I've already manually assigned people to each in their respective groups. Um, so we will have around 10 minutes um, to cover the scenario um, and then also figure out a strategy to reach a conclusion for, in this case, the, the restaurant owner, but in more of a realistic case, our stakeholders who are most the, the important people. All right, so I'm going to open up the rooms, and if it doesn't do it automatically, I'll just do it by hand, which is what technology is great for. So, and if you guys are having any um, technology issues, I can always meet you guys back up in the main session. Just shoot me a message. And so we'll start with the scenario again. As you guys all know, um, we are all pushing a new restaurant to launch in about in three weeks. And each team had a different scenario uh, where an issue came up. And so as project managers, um, you guys must have all discussed what the issues were, who should be involved, and how to communicate that to the right people um, and arrive to the best solution that is out there. And so I'll pass it off to my group, room one, um, to discuss the first scenario. All right. Okay. So it appears we have... Uh don't have our liquor permit. Now, the impact of that could be we could probably not hire the people we want, such as our bartenders, since uh, that's going to be a risk for us. Therefore, we're going to be delaying our opening. But as alternatives, we could open up a restaurant. We could either not have a bar or put a mock-in bar in place. So we are going to move forward with the opening, in other words. And of course, we're going to let the public know that we're going to have a restaurant and that we're going to provide either a mock bar or maybe an actual bar in the later years till we get our permit. We'll keep the public in the know, of course, if we actually get a bar, because uh, if we do get our license, the public is the first people that we want to notify. There you go. Thanks, Sean. No problem. All right. Um, not sure if there was anybody else who wanted to participate in group one. 
Um, if not, I'll pass it on to group two and see what your answer was. Awesome. So I'm going to speak on the behalf of group two. So in our scenario, the best sous chef walks out and it is days before the opening. So first we kind of consider the impact and our sous chef here is going to be kind of the first right-handed man. Seuss uh, is the second most important person in terms of the back of house. So this is a large impact and it's definitely going to affect uh, how fast the food is made, the quality, and it's really going to affect our efficiency. Um, so in this scenario, we kind of considered what can we do to aid this sort of situation? So uh, I think our first thought was with uh, the hierarchy in a kitchen, you start with someone like prep cooks. And in this scenario, we could move prep cooks up uh, to line cooks. And so that we kind of have a little bit more movement going on in the kitchen so that uh, with a sous chef gone, hopefully the efficiency isn't hurt, although we will be lacking a little bit of leadership. And also another thing we considered in this scenario would be shortening the menu. Uh, with shortening the menu, you will have uh, a less range of options uh, for people to choose from, therefore less people on the line that need to cook. Um, now, can we move forward with the grand opening? So this is like a difficult situation because um, we don't necessarily we, we, we can't give an entire, an entire answer for this, uh, something like this, because uh, without a sous chef, they're the second person in hand. So we could go forward, but we would have to do a lot to assess first. So we would communicate first with anyone who was also in the back of house. That would be your accountants and managers. And we would assess with the accountants and managers how our deliveries are going. If there's an, uh, you know, like a large impact and we're losing a lot of money if we delay our opening a week so that we can uh, kind of consider getting another sous chef or increasing our staff, uh, we can kind of assess what the damage would be. So I think we would connect with the head chef, we would talk to our distributors uh, and we would advise them, you know, what's going on in our scenario and how much it really would impact if we delayed it one week. Wow, so group one decided to just go ahead and launch and group two decided to delay. So group one's better than group two, gotcha. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> I joke, I joke, I joke. Um, all right, uh, so if there's nobody else from group two, I'm gonna move it up to group three and then afterwards we can conclude and see how different, how different scenarios kind of impacted each project. Sure. So I'm speaking for group three. Um, basically, we thought a little bit more broad level. Um, so we approached this. First of all, we spoke about um, predecessors. So what was what we should think about before we even thought about our problems. Um, so timelines for like such as like timelines for plumbers, gas lines, appliances, all of these things will need to change if we do change the menu. Because if you're making a Chinese restaurant and you want to just pivot the menu to make Indian food, it's not exactly a one-to-one -one change. You don't always use the same tools. So these are things that you definitely need to think about beforehand. Um, the options that we thought about were to provide a scenario, provide multiple scenarios to the owners. Um, these are things that could kind of help them think to kind of help them think broad level. Um, so we have options such as maybe changing the menu gradually instead of changing the menu all at once because there are things such as costs that you have to think about all of these appliances like I just mentioned. Um, and also you'll have to think about staff. You'll have to think about your cooks. Maybe we need new time for training. Maybe we'll need new time for uh, maybe we'll need new staff just because um, your cooks might only be familiar with one cuisine. They're not necessarily, you know, multidisciplinary legends. Um, and also we, appro we approach this thinking about um, negotiation. So maybe 
our restaurant could, instead of being specifically one cuisine, we can make it a hybrid um, restaurant. We could think about um, maybe incorporating this gradually so we don't have to kind of retrofit and change our menu over time. Um, so instead of just completely scrapping our menu just days before grand opening, we could maybe add um, two appetizers, maybe add one main. Um, and then after we open, we can gradually start changing our menu then. Um, so can we move forward with grand opening? It depends on which scenario you want to go on. It depends on, it's kind of like a choose your own path kind of thing. And how do we communicate it? We communicate it through, through negotiation, through all of these things that we talked about. Yeah. <laughs> All right, I can see. So scenario three, the head chef wanted to change the menu. So in scenario two, the sous chef walked out, right? Um, so glad to see how they all play together. Um, and I'm glad to see that they, we all reached a conclusion and we now know that there is no right or wrong answer um, as presented in each slide, um, but that there is a better one than the others. Um, and there's so many factors that play into um what makes a project kind of the outcome so whether you proceed or not um delays result in lost time or lost cost that go into it so now that we're kind of reaching the end um i will move it over to our q a section and i already have some few messages to me that i will read out loud um first we'll start off with Cheyenne, um, I'll give you the option whether you want me to read the question out loud or you yourself want to ask the question to the panelists. What the heck, I'll uh, read the questions to the panel. Okay, uh, first one. As a project manager, what projects have you supervised? Uh, um, I, I can go first. Um, so, um, all different types. I think before Paul Weiss, they were mainly focused on finance and finance either need, uh, tends to be a new product you're building or some type of compliance measure. Um, mm. And both can be pretty dry. Um, and coming to Paul Weiss, um, I, I got to you know experience things like building out new offices. Paul Weiss has offices in Tokyo, um, Hong Kong, London, and all of those offices were retrofitted um, and I got to work on those. I have no idea uh, or had no idea what to do in terms of construction, uh, what rules were in place for those offices, um, but it's a unique opportunity because of you know, this type of company. Um, so it really is um, you know, the gamut. I think what's kind of critical is as long as you have you know, a subject matter expert that you can pair off with, um, you know, you run through your discipline of project management and then they kind of feed into, you know, um, all the critical like decision making and, and uh, development and you're able to be pretty successful. Um, does anybody else want to maybe add to that? Um, Mark, it's Mayor, I'll add to it. Um, my experience is really similar to yours too. I also come from a finance background and so a lot of the projects that I initially worked on was, um, it was similar to Mark in that, oh, it's a new system for the traders, the sales team. Um, in other cases, it was other things like, hey, we're about to launch a new product that we're gonna sell to customers. Go figure that out. Um, so I did some of that. And then like Mark, when I um, joined the legal industry, I got a very different view of sort of project management. Um, when I first came here, I was working on building security. Like how do we change our building security? And so like Mark's experience, it was both, oh, hey, there's an application that helps you manage your security. But then there's also construction because now you've got to figure out like how to change equipment on doors and turnstiles. Yeah. Um, and so, it's been a great learning experience um, for that reason. And it's, and for me, like project management is such 
like a, a discipline that's so widely used anywhere. I think others on the team already echoed that, but I feel like I can truly just take it anywhere and I can learn whatever it is in the industry pretty quickly at this point. Thank you. Yeah, so I got another question in chat. Um, and this is also open to the floor as you guys are each project managers of your own responsibilities and tasks. How many teams would you say do you manage maybe at a given time or over the course of a year? I can, I can offer my, my thoughts. I mean, having worked, so I, a lot of the work that I've, I've um, a lot of the projects that I've worked on since I started at Paul Weiss were mainly around like technology, right? Um, working directly with some sort of technology. In this case, I think of more recent one collaboration tool teams, Microsoft teams. Um, and as far as, and I lost the train of thought, oh gosh, I'm sorry guys. <laughs> Helen, what was that again? <laughs> So how many teams does a project manager have? Yeah, so so what's interesting is that um, I may work with different teams. So in this case, I have my teams, um, you know, more working directly with like IS. And then you have teams that they could be part of another project uh, with some, with a department outside of IS. Um, it could be business development. Um, so in my case, I've, I've worked uh, on three projects at the same time, but I know several of my team members have worked on multiple projects and they can range from, you know, larger, with larger timelines or shorter timelines. So I guess it depends. Um, uh, Derek, did you wanna say yeah. something? Yeah, I'll add exactly the same thing. Like you're, I mean, like it depends on the project and to be more specific for what, I, what I'm doing lately, I found like depends on the project in that, um, you may have a project that you're managing with a set of, you know, four or five people as your core quote unquote team. You may have another project with the same amount of impact or value for whatever is being produced or done. And you may work with, you know, upwards to 15 to 20 people, but you are communicating with maybe like a manager or a director and they are then working underneath those teams. So where project one might be five people and you only know them and that's a team. Technically, that second project of 15 or 20 might be, you know, five different groups. And of those groups, um, they have different disciplines, like I already mentioned business development or, or human resources or something like that. Um, so it's it's kind of a harder question to answer only because it's um, it depends on whatever you're trying to do and who gets impacted by that. So that's kind of how those teams even get chosen. Um, I want to add one more thing to this. <laughs> um, Projects, um, I've worked in different organizations. Uh, before here, I worked for The Economist magazine. And a lot of the projects we managed there was for clients. So projects can be for internal or it could be external for client uh, facing too. So uh, that's something to think about, uh, about the, the kind of organization you wanna work with. So it could be potentially you're managing something for external clients and stakeholders on behalf of your company as well. Great. Um, so another question we have in chat is, um, what are some of the basic principles you should apply um, when it comes to establishing a project? I would say always stay neutral and don't take anything personally. Um, I would add, I think it's important to have the right group of people there at the start, they might not necessarily have activities or even be involved for months or a year, but at least starting the project with everyone that's going to work on it at, at a certain point helps when you're then ready to then bring in those teams that haven't had any you know activities yet, but are at least coming into something that's familiar are aware of the work that's gone into it, you know, um, before that they've joined. So, you know, that's called a project kickoff, right? It's where you bring all those people together, you state, you know, your goals, you provide that high level timeline. I think that's really critical to nail because then it's so much easier to call those people back and say, hey, I know it was a year ago when we said we were gonna do this, but we actually have something to look at. Can you come and look at it and join and give your feedback? 
I find that that, that works uh, really well. And, yeah, and that, just, that, I guess, just adds to, you know, transparency, like being transparent at, at the beginning. Uh, yeah, sure. Mark brings up a big, a good point. Um, you know, when you're starting a project, you don't know. There's so many people even at the, at this point that I don't know at Paul Weiss. Um, before any project, you know, make an introduction. Um, introduce yourself before the start of the project, right? Get to know them, get to understand what's important to them. Um, and I think that's that's really, you know, building that relationship is important before you you have that kickoff. I have to throw yeah, I have to yeah. throw in one in the same in the same vein as what Mark and Irene are saying here specifically. Um, oftentimes, like you see, and even this exercise, right? Like we all broke out and you got two of us on a breakout session. Assume that you are the person who has to talk when no one else is talking. Not necessarily to fill the space, but to to be the mediator and to be the one who pushes things along. Because sometimes things might not be going at a pace that you like, and you have to do that. Um, things going too fast, you have to push back. Um, so I would say maybe uh, be comfortable with being uncomfortable, and then quickly you'll find that it's, it's easier to, to talk than it is to not talk sometimes. <laughs> Derek was talking about me. I'm that guy. <laughs> I didn't say um, I'm going to take the next one. So this question will really just be for anyone, and it's not necessarily like project management related. Um, but since we're all still students and we don't have uh, as much experience in comparison to everyone else. Um, what advice would you give to yourself if you could go back in college? Oh man, for me, <laughs> I didn't get a chance to travel abroad. So I'm going to stick with that. <laughs> um, I would say the first or even second job you get may not impact or have anything to do with your career. Um, you'll learn so much about what you like about a given job or and don't like about a given job in those first you know, few years out of college. So if it's year three, and you're like, why did I study finance? I should have been an engineer. Um, there's more than enough time to go back and be an engineer. Uh, but then there's also ways that you can kind of split the difference and fall into engineering, but maybe you are you know, part of the finance team or an engineering company. So really give yourself you know, that flexibility that you know, you're still learning in your first couple of years. And um, those first couple of jobs won't be indicative of where you end up at year 10, 20. For, for myself, if I could speak to college age, Derek, it would be um, make more mistakes and don't be afraid to put yourself out there. Right? Like, Cause I'll tell you right now, years after college, like. There's so many opportunities that I had that I don't regret not doing, but like I was afraid I was going to be embarrassed or someone would remember me. And like, I don't remember a million people that I met in college. So life is long. So just make the mistake, do the thing you want to do. Well, these are some great advice. Um, one that I'll take. I don't know about studying abroad, Mary. I graduate like next semester. <laughs> I wish. Um, yeah, see, it's on your list. <laughs> definitely. I think that the trouble about studying abroad is that it has to align with your major. Like you must be taking classes that align with your curriculum when studying abroad. And most of the time when I've been looking at study abroad programs is that most of them are something about studying history, studying the art and studying the language. So your major must align with language, arts and history. And I mean, most of us are in computer information systems. We're gonna go to like Germany to study like computer science. Um, those are super tough programs to get into and also just to find in the first place. They get um, populated pretty quickly. Yeah. Um, have another question. Um, this question, not sure if you guys are willing to share with us. So think of it as the, the Krabby Patty formula. What is the secret to your success when managing a project? Or what are your best approaches? Go ahead, Sandra. I saw you go. <laughs> you went on mute. You went on mute. I can, I can. Don't uh, give up. That That's it. Don't, don't give up. A lot of times. A lot of times. Um, you know, uh, to manage a project, you need um, 
people, your stakeholders or people working on your project to, to deliver certain things on time. Or there's a little structure and dependencies. And, um, and it, it's sometimes if they don't get back to you and uh, it can be very frustrating, it can impact your project from moving forward. So um, advice is like, uh, don't give up, uh, pursue it, uh, keep, keep at it. Um, uh, and uh, eventually things will get done. <laughs> yeah, and, and I would say um, for me, it's uh, just bringing my authentic self. Whatever it is that I am able to contribute, how I'm able to manage my team is just how I run things. You know, it's, it's, it's my way, right? And be comfortable and okay with, with bringing a little bit of who you are into that space. Um, I think that's helped me a lot. And also, you know, help out when you can, right? Because you're not always managing the team and, you know, directing uh, team members, right? Sometimes you have to, you know, you need to help the team out. So um, I think sometimes, you know, being able to lend that help in hand uh, might not be the, the the nicest job, but, you know, I think it helps the team kind of keep the project moving forward. Yeah, also going off what Irene shared, uh, sometimes in projects, yeah, you're going to have to roll your sleeves up and, and, and get in there with the team. And they're going to appreciate that. And, they're, and when the next project comes around, they'll remember you for that. And you're already establishing your relationships as, as you progress through uh, other projects in the future. Um, maybe one last one. I think what's really been helpful, and this might be more IT focused, is that when you're working on development, you might have a brilliant developer um, who might not have those soft skills, right? Um, doesn't really you know, speak up in the project meetings, uh, but you know that they're a superstar and they're carrying that project. What's worked for me is I've always made sure to empower and propel that person so that when things are going great, everyone knows where it's generating from. Even if that person never talks at a project meeting, um, you don't hear from that person. You know, People see the success as you know, being generated from those superstar people. Um, and then that just creates a really great relationship where the next time you go to work on something, um, they, know, they know that you are a peer and you're not, you know, a, a layer above the work. Um, that's really worked well for me. Um, uh, and I would say anytime you have an opportunity to do that, not even in a project, but just with your coworkers, take the opportunity to do that. You know, give people kudos uh, when they do something awesome. It goes a long way. I'll take the next one. Uh, thank you for that one. Um, so in this sort of role, it's obviously kind of difficult to quantify results. Um, so how do you guys find fulfillment? And, you know, in comparison to say, most of us are here are aspiring coders where you work on a ticket basis. So for something like this, how do you find fulfillment in, you know, kind of a never ending goal? I've got a really yeah, quick one here. My boss is on, so. <laughs> You save me there. Uh, the, the one that I always go to is um, sometimes it's not about like, I think it's a very easy trap to fall into as a PM to say, we're supposed to get this project done by X date with X specifications or what have you. And uh, I, I try to take it day by day and just say, did I do the job that I thought I could do the best of? Right? Did I make all the calls I should have? Did I create the documentation I was supposed to? And sometimes that answer is no, and I, I take back that and try to work on it for the next time. Um, so even if a date gets slipped or, or whatever, the, but the um, exercise that we had, right? It's not necessarily about, do we launch that? Sometimes it's about, did you do everything you were supposed to do? Um, and did you play your part? Yeah, I would um, I would second that. Um, you know, you have to you have to be comfortable with not getting the credit, right? Um, you work with a team who's doing the work, and just for me, the the gratification that I get in projects is 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 uh, starting something from beginning and seeing it through to the end, um, and seeing that my team has executed um, what they they agreed to or they were committed to. Um, and being able to see that that joy 
right? That's what we all aspire is to see them enjoy the work that they're doing. Um, and so that, that's, that to me is, is success, right? It makes me feel like, okay, I did something um, that was, um, you know, that, that was for purpose. And that's all I can expect. <laughs> I'm happy with that. <laughs> Thanks, Irene. If I could just add, I guess my perspective on this is, you know, very similar to what other people are, are um, saying, um, you know, I'm definitely in it for the long game, right? Like there's, there's, you know, you, you want to be there from the start to the end, so to speak, like Irene was talking about. But for me, it's gratifying, yeah, to see the end product and see it come to life. But it's also gratifying to know that, yeah, we're done and everybody's still happy, <laughs> you know? And so I think that's, that, that's pretty awesome too. Yeah, I'm gonna put a little different angle to this. Uh, what I like, I like challenge and sometimes um, we're confronted with challenges about how to get things going. And uh, I love to solve problems. So uh, figuring out how to untangle the, 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 the situation you're in uh, with, uh, it just, uh, I like that. <laughs> that. That is very satisfying for me uh, because then sometimes you really get into complicated uh, situations uh, as we discussed the, during the uh, you know, exercise today and uh, figuring out a way to solve them uh, uh, is, is for me, it's really fun. <laughs> Thank you guys. I really appreciate that. I wanted to ask um, if if anyone has read any leadership books that may have helped them um, at their job. I, I know Mark was talking earlier about having that rock star developer and that like sparked the light bulb in my head because I remember reading the book Radical Candor. I don't know if that rings a bell for you, Mark. Um, and I, although like I love writing code, I hope someday to be a manager, principal engineer, some type of leadership role, which is why I joined today's meeting. So if you have any book recommendations, I'm all ears. I feel like um, a lot of mine are more attributed to like sports, if anything. And I think it's the team dynamic of, you know, overcoming some type of adversity um, and especially because more recently I've been into, you know, um, long distance running triathlon, um, you know, people like, uh, Rich Roll, um, are really interesting and, and, and maybe afterwards, um, Helen, I can send you uh, a couple of those books that can maybe, uh, get added, but just this idea of, uh, exactly what Sandra said is like, how do you, um, overcome that adversity, but then do it together and then tying back to what Mary said, not hate each other afterwards, like really create that bond uh, through adversity. Um, and so, yeah, I, I think that, you know, everything that's kind of led to you know, my style right now is a little bit of that, but I'll be honest, it's mostly like working with my coworkers right here. You know, every one of us has such a different style um, and both every style works in almost every different scenario. But, um, you know, being able to kind of throw out ideas and have, you know, um, Irene, who's worked at a, another, you know, rival law firm that's set up very differently, you know, her opinion on how they did things, maybe better or maybe worse, helps so much in like our management discussions and leadership discussions. So um, for me, it's, I guess it's more internal, you know, it's like this team as a sounding board um, uh, really help with that. Um, thank you, Mark. Uh, Derek, I also want to add, I don't know if you've heard of the book called Grit, The Power of Passion and Pers Perseverance. Um, hear about it now. So that's Okay, my... <laughs> okay. <laughs> I think that's a, good, a great book to reference um, for anyone across all, all uh, majors. It, it, it really goes into showing the psychology that goes into not giving up moving forward and just bringing that grit performance to your job in anything that you're doing um, to propel and evolve in your career. Yeah, well, since everyone's sharing books, me too. 
Um, this is not coming from me though. This is coming from my mentor and he doesn't work in project management, but he is in cybersecurity. Um, one book called Brag, The Art of Tooting Your Own Horn Without Blowing It um, is really helpful to college students. Um, we always ask ourselves, you know, how do we sell um, who we are to uh, recruiters because we don't really have experience. We don't really have the right industry background um, to get into an entry level job or the jobs that we really want. Um, that book is great. And Mark, if you send me um, a collection of books or if anybody else wants to, to share with me resources about project management or things that have gotten you to where you are, I'll be more than glad to share that with our cohort. Um, I don't see any more questions being sent to me via chat, so I think we can move to wrapping up. Um, I'm sure a little bit afterwards, you guys might get some a few connections on your LinkedIn. Um, maybe to make it a little bit easier for students, drop it down in the Zoom chat below and get connected. Um, this would be the time, but <laughs> I'll be wrapping it up now. Um, so for all those who have joined us today, Thank you so much. Um, and we'll be having our event tomorrow, Intro to D Data Structures. So, and thank you to our lovely panelists for coming and joining us today. This was a long process and I'm glad to see that you guys all enjoyed your time and have shared your insight with our college students at Baruch. Thank you so much. Thanks everyone. Thank Thanks you for having us. Thank you everyone. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.